Hi and welcome to the OnMaths GCSE prediction for the OCR Higher Tier Paper 5, which is the second non-calculator paper. Enjoy! Hi, I'm Chris Gilpin and welcome to the OnMaths prediction for the second OCR GCSE Maths paper. Now this is for the new spec, so this is the 9 to 1. If you're redoing um, the paper, then obviously there's going to be a few topics in this that won't be on your paper. So what is this that we are doing? What's the video about? We can cover a predicted paper. Now I've got the paper one, so I've looked through all the topics that came up and have tried to predict what will come up on paper two. Basically, uh, it won't be those topics and the example of stress it might be. Um, I predict that you know if, if some of the big topics come up, they're not going to come up again. Um, and I just go through the paper. Now, please use this as part of your revision, not solely relying on this, which I know uh, no one is. Um, but this is a quite a good tool just to make sure that you understand the topics that probably will come up. Now, um, this is a video of our prediction we've done on the website on maths.com where you can for free go online and do this paper but the beauty of the website is the numbers keep changing so you will every time you do the paper you're remembering methods and not answers so you can do it as many times as you want and the numbers will be different each time and sometimes the the focus of the question will be slightly different um, if you sign up for free um, it will save your scores you don't need to sign up but if you choose to for free it will save your scores for you so you can do it today and then you can have a go tomorrow and see whether your revision has had an impact so um, on the OnMap site we have topic busters for every single topic now uh, it's taken over a year to write them but now they're for every single topic um, so if you uh, want to revise estimation then you can just type in estimation and have a go on the topic buster on the site and there's also minute marks which are quick multiple choice uh, questions that have videos on them to say how the right answer was got anyway i'm rambling now so without further ado let's get started okay so this question is a little bit more complicated than it first seems so we've got adrian ben and charlie and they share some sweets in the ratio of six to three to eight and it says that Charlie got 12 more sweets than Adrian. Well, first of all, let's have a look and see how many more parts that um, Charlie... Ooh. Always cross my L's for some reason. Charlie uh, got more than Adrian. Okay, so he got eight takeaways, six is two. So he got two more parts. And so let's have a look and see what one part is worth. So those two parts equate to 12 more sweets. So we do 12 divided by two, six. So each part is worth six sweets. And it says work out the total amount of sweets. So we need to work out how many parts there are in total. So we do six plus three plus eight. Now I know um, six plus eight is uh, 14, plus three is 17. So we've got 17 parts in total. Each of them is worth six sweets. So to work out the amount of sweets, we do 17 times six. Now we could do seven times six, which is 42, 10 times 6, which is 60. So add the two together, it's 102. So there are 102 sweets altogether. So we're given quite a basic diagram. We're given a pair of parallel lines and we're given two angles from them. And angles on the parallel lines, there are four um, things you should be thinking about. So the first one is corresponding, those are F angles. The next one is alternate which are Z angles. The next one has loads of names. It's co-interior, interior, allied, whichever your teacher says. And the last one is vertically opposite. Now, vertically opposite occur in other places as well, not just parallel lines. 
but that's normally the one that you will be using. So let's have a look. Well, what letter does that make? So if I draw out from the parallel lines, I always say it's the armpits of the letter. So if it's a Z, it's the armpits of the Z. And if it's an F, it's the armpits of the F. Well, this is like an upside down backwards F. So we know that upside down backwards F, any F angles are going to be the same. So I know that's 62 degrees. Now we've got to give a reason. So the reason is corresponding. Now I always got corresponding and alternate mixed up. So I, I don't know whether this will help you, but I always think cor f ponding and alternate. Please don't spell it that way, but I just literally bung the letter into the word and I've never got them muddled up since. So that might help you. The other one, the C angle, um, are not equal. So these ones here are not equal. Um, they add up to 180 degrees. Um, so just be careful with that. The rule of thumb is if you're guessing and they look the same, even if it says it's not drawn to scale, if they look the same, then if you have no other memory of what they're likely to be, if you forget about angles and parallel lines, just write down the same angle. If the one's acute and one's obtuse, just take it away from 180 degrees and maybe you'll get some marks. But hopefully you'll remember the uh, corresponding alternate uh, co-interior or interior allied and vertically opposite. Okay, there's more than one way to expand and simplify a single bracket. You're essentially doing the same thing, but some of you might want to draw grids or do it in a different way. I always just use smiles and rainbows, so I just create a um, smile between the 2 and the 3x and a rainbow between the 2 and the 6 and I little, put a little time sign there to remind me to times it. Just put a notch through the bracket. That means we're going to times 2 and 3x, and 2 times 3 is 6, and then we've got the x there. And 2 times 6 we're going to times together to make 12. Now we've still got the 4x, so I still need to write that down. Then I'm going to collect like terms. Now the like terms we have is the 6x and the plus 4x. So 6x plus 4x is 10x. And then there's nothing that we can do with the 12, so we just leave that. So it's 10x plus 12. Okay, the next one, there's a double smiles and rainbows. We've got one here, a bit old time sign there, and we've got one here. So we'll do the first one first. So 8 times 6x, so we do 8 times 6, which is 48, and then we've got the x. Then we do 8 times positive 2, which is 16, so plus 16. Now that's nice and easy. However, the next one's slightly different. The one out, the number outside the brackets is not a 3. It's a minus 3. So when we do minus 3 times positive 4x, we're going to get a negative, because a minus times a positive is a negative. Then we do 3 times 4, which is 12, and then we've got the x as well. Now the rainbow is minus 3 times minus 5. 2 minuses times together is a plus. 3 times 5 is 15. Then we look for like terms. So we've got the 48x and the minus 12x. And we've got the plus 16 and the plus 15. So we want to do 48 take away 12 or 48x take away 12x. So if we take away 2 it's 6. If we take away 10 it's 36 x. Then we want to do 16 plus 15. Well, 15 plus 15 is 30, so that's going to be 31. So the answer is going to be 36x plus 31. Now the most common mistakes are for that end bit there, this bit here. Sometimes students will write down negative 15. Okay, so we've got a scatter graph question, and the first question asks us just to plot the information from the table into the scatter graph. So we've got ice cream sales at the top and temperature at the bottom, which is not kind of the same way around as on the graph, so we've just got to be careful. So the ice cream sales are 46, which is here on the scale, and the temperature is 31, which is here on the scale. And just check that your 
you're looking at the scale correctly. So we're looking about, let's have a look, about here. Okay, next one, ice cream sales 40, which is here on the scale, and uh, temperature 34, which is here. So we've just got to be careful, and it's about there. So those are the two plots that we want to take. Next question says, on another day, um, ha another day had an average temperature of 45 degrees. Use the scatter graph to estimate the sales of the day. Now, you need to get used to just drawing a line of best fit to any scatter graph that you come across. You will have to do it, okay? So just do it. Just, even if it doesn't ask you to, just draw a line of best fit. Now, a line of best fit is just a line that follows all the data like that. You should have roughly the same amount of data, top and bottom, but it doesn't matter if it's not perfect, okay? So, let's have a look. So we've got average temperature of 45 degrees. So we're going to draw a line up from 45 degrees, which is about there. And we're going to draw... Oh, the line didn't come up. So let's draw that line there. It's refusing to come up for some reason. Uh, let's try another one. There we go. Let's try another line. Uh, okay, let's do it the old-fashioned way. Okay, and then we draw a line across from where it's the line of best fit. Now, to me, that looks like about 55, but if you had the same question and you came up with a different answer of 54 or 58, it still can be correct because you might have drawn a slightly different line of best fit. Okay, so don't worry if you sit uh, sit down next to someone do the same question and get a slightly different answer. Just draw the lines, straight lines, unlike mine, onto your diagram to show the examiner that you um, worked it out. So we've got 55 sales we're predicting. Now, what do we notice about this? Well, look at where all the data is. All the data is here, and yet we're estimating outside the range of the data. Okay, it's called extrapolation, where you do that. So the problem with that, if you imagine we do a graph of height against age, so we have age at the bottom and height up the side, then when you're very young, you grow quite quickly. And if someone extrapolated your data and said, oh, okay, well, that growth is going to continue, when you're 80 years old, you're going to be 20 foot high. Well, that doesn't make much sense. It's because we're quite confident with down here, because we've got data for that, but we're not very confident with this bit here. We don't know whether the trend continues. Now, with ice cream sales, if it's ridiculously hot, no one's going to leave their house. They're all going to be sitting inside with their air conditioning or sitting in their car with their air conditioning. So we know it probably won't continue. So if you just say that the, um, the estimate... is outside the range of the data and if you want to really impress the examiner then you can use the word extrapolated it's been extrapolated So this question says there's a tennis tournament uh, being played where each player plays each other once. And there's multiple ways of doing this. One of the ways is listing out all the different combinations. But this question only asks for how many tennis matches are being played. So you don't need to list them out. And sometimes you will need to list them out. This one you don't. So let's start off with a liar. A liar has four people that they're going to play against. William... So, William, Paul, Samantha, and Christine. William, well, we've already counted Elias' match with William, so William only has three left that he can play. Then Paul has already, we've already counted his match with the other two, so he's only going to play Samantha and Christine, other than his matches we've already counted. Samantha, well, Samantha's only got Christine left to play, after we uh, counted all the other matches. And Christine, well, Christine's matches have already been counted so far. So, 
we've got the four matches Elias going to play, the three matches that William's going to play, not counting the one we've already counted from Elias, plus the two Paul's going to play, plus the other one that Samantha's going to play. So, four plus three is seven, plus two is nine, plus one is ten. So, in total, there are ten different matches going to be played. Whenever we see a 3D shape in a question, you've got to ask yourself, is the question asking for a volume or a surface area? And that should be the first question that goes into your mind. Yes, it might be asking for something else, but those are the main two. We're looking at this, we're filling the swimming pool with water, so it's going to be a volume question. Now, the way of approaching this is figure out what the shape is. Well, the shape is um, a um, trapezium-based prism. So we've got to first of all work out what the area of the trapezium is. So I'm going to draw the trapezium out first. And that height is going to be 2.7 that side, 5.3 that side, and 25 across. And I'll leave off meters because I know they're all in meters. But do check they are all in meters when you do this. So we've got to first of all work out the area. Now the area of a trapezium is half A plus B H. Now A and B are always the two parallel sides. And then the height is the one that connects them at right angles. So the height is going to be 25 there. And all you're doing is working out the average of the two um, uh, bases, the 2.7 and the 5.3. We're times that by 25. Okay, so we'll crack our calculator out. 2.7. Some of you will probably see this straight away. So the first bit comes out as 4, because halfway between 2.7 and 5.3 is 4, and then times 25 is going to be 100. So the area is 100 metres squared. Now, for a prism, so volume, all you need to do is work out the area of the cross-section, which is this bit here, the bit we just worked out, and then times it by how 3D it is. I think they call that the length officially, 15 metres. So the volume is going to be 100 metres squared times 15, which is going to be 1,500 metres cubed. So that's what the volume is, and it says the machine transports the water at a rate of 20 metres cubed per minute. So in one minute it's going to be 20, in two minutes 40. The other way of working this out, or the other way of thinking about this, is how many 20s are there in 1,500? So we can say time equals. So this is how much it's got to, fi uh, got to fill. And this is how much it does per minute. So on the calculator, 1,500 divided by 20, which equals 75 minutes. So it's going to take 75 minutes to fill the pool. Okay, for Venn diagrams, it's really important to understand the notation. This symbol here means union. It just means or. It means it can be in A, or it can be in B, or it can be in both. So it's any number inside either circle. So I could have 9, 5, 3, 7, 18, or 2. Let's go for 9. But the other 5 would be correct. This symbol here... I always view it as an AND. I always put a little line there to say A for AND. And it means it needs to be in A and B. It can't just be in A, it can't just be in B. It needs to be in both. And there's two numbers that uh, fit that bill, 3 and 7. So I could write 3 or I could write 7. Now this little symbol here, okay, and it's an A with a dash. That dash there means not. 
So we're looking for numbers that aren't in A and are in B. Well, let's have a look at where not A is. Well, it's anywhere around here. Anywhere around here is not in A. And let's have a look at where B is. So B is anywhere here. So the numbers that overlap both of those are the 18 and the 2. So it's 18 and 2. So there are two numbers that fit that bill. So that will go at the top of our fraction. And there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in total. Now I can simplify that a little bit to make it a quarter. And so my answer to that will be 1 over 4 or a quarter. So we're told one kilogram of cheese costs um, £7.70. How much would 600 grams cost? Well, first of all, I'm going to have um, weight, mass, and price. And I'm just going to sort of split them down the middle. So the weight, well, one kilogram is not going to help us because this one's in grams. So I'm going to convert that to grams. So it's a 1,000 grams. And I'm going to convert this into pence, so 770 pence. Okay, so I need to get to 600 grams. And so first of all, if I've got a calculator, I can do this a lot easier. But without a calculator, let's try. Well, I can first of all um, divide this by 10 to get it so that it's 100. So that's 100 grams. And that would be 77. And then what I can do is I can times these by 6 to get 600. Okay, so if you've got a calculator, you can just type in. But let's assume that you don't for this question. So we've got 77 times 6. Uh, 6 times 7 is 42. Add a 0. 6 times 7 is 42. Add them together. Probably don't need to do this, but anyway, I'll do it anyway. Uh, two six four so it's 462 pence but in pounds it would be four pounds 62 last thing just check it makes sense well we have we've got about we've got just over half so therefore the price is just over half so it looks good to me okay so the rules of indices are if you times together two powers with the same base and by base we mean the big number on this one it's a so we've got a and a what you do is you add the powers okay so this becomes a to the power of four plus seven four plus seven is eleven so it's a to the power of eleven now the next rule of indices is if you've got a power inside a bracket and a power outside of a bracket you can times them so it's m to the power of three times six so it's m to the power of 18. now the reason both those rules work is a to the power of four is just a times a times a times a and then we're timesing it by a to the power of seven so a to the power of 7 is a times a blah 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 so we've got four of them here and we've got seven of them here this next one is m to the power of 3 which is m times m times m and we're timesing it by itself six times so we're going to do m times 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 m we're going to do that six times. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So in total, we will have 18 M's together. Okay, so for this next one, this is a slightly harder one. What you need to do is just do the numbers first. Then we're going to do the R's. And then we're going to do the S's. Okay. So 27, uh, so over means divide, okay? So 27 divided by 9 is just going to be 3. Now this is R on its own. Now R on its own is R to the power of 1. And we're dividing it by R to the power of 7. Now when you times powers, you add them. When you divide them, you take away. So we're going to be doing R 
to the power of 1 minus 7. 1 take away 7 is just minus 6. And then we're doing s to the power of 14 divided by s to the power of 6. 14 take away 6 is 8. Okay, so this question looks really, really complicated, but there's a very, very easy way of doing it, and that's to construct a two-way table. So I'm going to construct the two-way table first from all the information, and I notice there's a lot of information that says um, total, so I'm going to make sure I have a total column in that, in this two-way table. And so we've got uh, the different subjects. Okay. So what have we got? We've got male, we've got female, and then we've got total, and then we've got maths, we've got English, and we've got science, we've got total. Okay, 123 students attended the session, so the total of the totals is 123. They picked one subject. Some of them went to maths, right, okay. So 59 of the students are female. So the total females is 59, okay. 24 of the 48 students who went to English are male. So the total for English is 48. And 24 of them were male. 31 of the students went to science. 31 went to science, 26 uh, males went to maths. So 26 males went to maths, which would be this one. Okay, so that's just the information given to us on the table. But what we can do is fill out the rest of them. So either calculator or non-calculator. Um, to get this first one here, okay, what I do is 123, which is the total, and there were 59 females in total. So that leaves 64 males. So 64 plus 59 is 123. Okay, if I know that one, then let's have a look and see which one we're trying to find out. Work out the total number of females who went to science. So we're trying to get this one here. Okay. So if I get this one here next. So what I want to do is I want to do 64, take away the 24 males who went to English, take away the 26 males who went to maths, that leaves 14 males who went to science. And there were 31 scientists in total, and 14 of them were male, and that leaves the answer of 17. Now there's different ways of doing that. You could have gone a different way. We could have started down here and tried to go along here, which is absolutely fine. That would have worked as well. And you didn't have to do the two-way table but when I've marked these types of question before, the students who consistently get them right are the ones who do a two-way table. So it might not be a bad idea. Okay, so this is a standard recipe question. And the important thing to realize is that these ingredients are for 16 and we want to try and get 24. So I can't go straight from 16 to 24. Well, I can, but without using fractions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out how much I need for 8, and then I'm going to times that by 3 to get 24. Okay, so to find out how many 8, obviously we're going to divide them by 2, and then we're going to times them by 3. So for 8, okay, so half of 96, well half of 90 is 45, half of 6 is 3, so that's going to be 48. Uh, half of 80 is 40, half of 48 is 24, and half of 2 is 1. And then what I can do is just add the 16 and the 8 together to get to 24, or I could times the 8 by 3. So the first one's 48, and I just want to times that by 3, or add the 96, you still get the same answer, it's 144. Uh, then I want to times the next one by 3, or add it to the 80, which makes 120. If I draw it right. Uh, the next one I want to times that by 3, and that gives me 72. 
and the last one will times that by 3 which is 3 so it's uh, 144 120 72 and 3 okay next one says I've got um, only a kilogram of self raising the raven self raising flour but enough of the other ingredients so first thing to realize is that one kilogram is 1000 grams and we know for um, where is it 16 so for 16 we need 96 grams so therefore for 160 we will need 960 grams so just times them by 10 okay so we've got 40 grams left now the problem with this is um, we need probably to work out how much one is worth so with the 96 making 16 I want to do um, how many 16s there are in 96 so first 96 divided by 16 so to make one I need six grams of self-raising flour for one um, biscuit so how many sixes are left there well there's 40 left so 40 grams left and so what I want to do is I want to do 40 divided by 6 which means, uh, well, 6 times 6 is 36, so I can have another 6. So I can have this 160, and also I can have another 6. So that's 166. Now you could have done this with a calculator straight away by just doing 1,000 divided by um, 1,000 divided by 6. And when you do that in the calculator, 1,000 divided by 6 is... 166.66 or 6 recurring I should say don't need that one um, and that means we can get 166 biscuits and we'll have some left over so the amount of biscuits we can make is 166 so you can do this with or without a calculator first thing really is to work out how much one biscuit needs how much flour one biscuit needs which was 6 grams which we worked out here and find out how many sixes there are in a thousand. Okay, so a simple standard form question. Um, now, the best, easiest way of doing this is first of all, write the decimal down, 9.6. And although you're discouraged from moving the decimal point at all times, on standard form, I find it much, much easier. Now, first thing to notice, if the power of the 10 is negative, which it is here, it means we've got a very small number. If it's positive, we've got a very big number. Now, this we need to know this because if we're going to have a very big number, we're going to jump the decimal point to the right. If we're going to have a very small number, which we do here, we're going to jump it to the left. Now, it says minus 7, so we're going to jump it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So the decimal point is going to end up here. Now all those jumps that we did, we need to fill them in with zeros. And you normally start a decimal with zero point, so we're going to add another zero there. So it's going to be 0 0.00000096. Don't ever put two decimal points in, okay, we've moved the decimal point to the new position you'll never have a decimal with two decimal points now I'm just going to double check the zero so one two three four five six and we've got one two three four five six perfect now to make a number standard form write the number out two three five zero zero okay and first of all work out where the decimal point is now well if it's not shown it's always at the end of the number so it's here now we've got to figure out where we want it to go. Now the number in standard form, the decimal that, that precedes it, or the number that's before the times 10 to the power of something, has to be between 1 and 10, but not 10. Okay. So if I move the decimal point, so if I'm going to jump it, so we're going to do one jump, 
that's not quite right. That's going to be 2,350. That's way above 10. 2, that's 235. Still above 10. 3, that's 23.5. We're close, but we're still above 10. And 4. If we put it in there, then we get 2.35, which is between 1 and 10. And we jumped it 4 times. Now remember what I said before, if it's a big number, it's a positive. If it's a small number, it's a negative. Well, this is a big number, 23,500. That's a big number. So it's going to be positive, and it's going to be positive 4. Okay, my advice with all these questions is always draw a diagram. So I'm just going to draw a line, and I'm going to put the various places on it. So we've got um, Chilton, which I'm going to call C. We've got Devley, which I'm going to call D. We've got Boko, which I'm going to call B. Okay, so I'm just going to put the information on. There's 31 miles here. And there's 10 miles here. And there's, uh, what is it? Average speed of 62 miles per hour. Okay, so we need to understand the speed distance time triangle, which I can quickly draw here. And it just means, uh, well, you just got to remember distance at the top. Speed and time doesn't matter which way around. You cover up the one you're looking for, and it shows you how to do it. So the first one, we're looking for the amount of time it's going to take. So I'm going to cover up the time, okay? And it tells me that it's going to be um, distance divided by speed. So the distance is 31. So I'm going to say um, CD time. Let's just get rid of that. It's going to be the distance, which is 31, divided by the speed. And 31 over 62, well, that if I divide top more by 31, that becomes a half. So it's half an hour. So we know if it's 9 o'clock here, that he leaves um, Chelton, he'll be at Devley at 9.30. Now the question says, how quick does he have to go to get there for 9.45? So that's 15 minutes. So we know that the uh, distance is 10 miles, and we know it's a quarter of an hour he's got. Okay, so looking at the speed to distance time triangle again, let's just put time back. So what we go cover up? Well, we're looking for the speed, so we cover up speed. It's distance over time. Okay, so D, B, speed is distance, which is 10, over time, which is a quarter of an hour. Now, over just means divide. So this is the same as 10 divided by a quarter. How many quarters are there in 10? Well, if you're good with fractions, you'll know you can do same change flip, same change flip 4 over 1 is just 4 and that's 40 so you'd have to travel at 40 miles per hour now you can do that on the calculator or you can do the non calculator method which I've shown here okay so this looks like quite a complicated question and it's complicated because there's lots of bits and lots of things going on now the first place to start um, might be to figure out this block here or it might be to figure out this block here and it doesn't really matter which one we start but I just think the second one is a bit easier place to start let's work out how many mer uh, merit points we have now we've got the money but the 16 pounds 8 pence is in pounds and the 3 pence for each merit point is in pence so um, I'm going to show the examiner I'm working out how many merit points so merit points okay so I'm going to see how many merit points they have okay so first of all I'm going to change the pounds into pence so I'm going to make it 1608 pence and if each one's worth three pence then to work out how many we've got we just divide it by three and I'm going to do this over on the right hand side 
So I'm going to do the bus stop method. So 1608. Threes into one don't go, that makes that 16. Threes into 16 go 5, carry 1. Threes into 10 go 3, carry 1. Threes into 18 go 6. So 536 merit points. Okay, next we need to work out how many James, Sarah and Robert have. Now the way of doing this, um, and this is quite common with algebra type questions, is you're going to have uh, an expression for the total merit points and we're going to have it in algebra and we're going to have it as a number. Now as a number we already know it's 536 but in algebra we're going to put James's down which is x, that's a nice easy one and we'll put Sarah's down. Now Sarah has three times more than James if James has x, so we'll have 3x. And to work out our total, we add them together, so I'm going to put a plus there. Now, Robert has 49 fewer than James. So he has James's x take away 49. Now, whenever we solve, I always put lines down. Okay, where, where the equal sign is. Now, I'm just going to collect the like terms. So x plus 3x plus x is 5x. I'm not going to do anything with anything else just yet. Okay, now we've got a minus 49 there, so to get rid of that I'm going to plus 49 both sides. Okay, and so we've got 5x equals, now to add 49 you can add 50 and take away 1. So when I add 50 I get 586 so this will be 585, because so I take away the 1. Okay, we're going to then divide by 5, both sides. And again, I'll need the bus stop method, so how many 5s in 5, 8, 5. 1 goes into 5, 1 goes into 8, but I carry 3, and 7 go into 35. So x equals 117. Now James has x, so it's going to be 117 for him. Sarah has three times as many, so I could do this in my head, but I'm not going to. I'm going to do this using the grid method. So it's going to be 110 and 7. Okay, so that's 330 and 21. And so it's going to be 300 and 51 and Robert has uh, 49 and fewer so it's going to be 117 take away 49 okay so I'm going to have to uh, borrow one from there to make that 17 17 take away 9 it's going to be 8 I have to borrow that 1 to make that 10 10 take away 4 is 6, so 68, and again I could have taken away 50 and added 1. Okay, and that's it. So there's a lot of places to start with this question. Whenever I'm given a shape in a question like this, I always ask myself, well, do I need to work out the perimeter of it or the area? And sometimes you're going to have to figure out something else, but it's mainly going to be those two things. Well, this is all about covering the floor, so I'm imagining I'll need to work out the area. So I'm going to start off working out the area. Now, to do that, I've got to work out what shape it is. Well, it's a trapezium because there's two parallel sides and it's four-sided. So if you've got a pair of parallel sides and it's four-sided, it's a trapezium. So to work out the area, the formula is half A plus B H. Now you need to work out what H and A and B are. A and B are always the ones on the parallel sides. So it's those two. It doesn't matter which way round you call them. H is always the one that connects the two at right angles. So half 2.5 plus 1.5 times 
11.5. So I can get my calculator out and I can do 0 0.5 times brackets 2.5 plus 1.5 close brackets times 11.5 and that gives me the answer of 23. So the area of this is 23 meters squared. Okay, so I've, I've managed to work that out. Let's have a look. So tiles are sold in packs, 25% off marked price, and they're marked at £12. So next thing we can work out is how much they actually cost. And it doesn't matter if you do this in a different order, as long as you do each step and label it well. So um, cost of pack. Okay, so we've got £12 and we need to reduce it by 25%. Okay, so first of all, I need to work out 25% of £12. So the way I can do that is just find a quarter of 12, so divide it by 4, so that's going to be £3. So the cost is going to be £12, take away my £3 discount, which is going to be £9. So the cost of the pack is £9. Okay, so it feels like we're getting somewhere. Now, if each one costs £9, but each one covers 2 metres squared. Okay, so we know we've got 23 metres squared to cover. So what I can do is I can work out how many packs I need. So packs needed. So I've got 23 to, uh, meters squared to cover, and each pack covers two. So I do 23 divided by two. Now that gives me the answer of 11.5. So I need 11 and a half packs. Well, unfortunately, shops don't like you taking half a pack. Trust me, I've tried. They really don't like it. So you must always round this up. Otherwise, you won't have enough. If you round it down, say if it came out as 11.4, if you rounded that down, you won't have enough. So there'll be a patch of untiled floor in your kitchen. That's not good. So the answer is going to be 12. So I need 12 packs. So total price. So I need 12 packs, and each of them costs £9. So 12 times 9 is 108 pounds so it's going to cost 108 pounds now the last bit of the question she says she's got 100 pounds to spend how much extra so it wants it in pence as well my goodness so we need to do uh, extra and all i'm doing here is doing 108 take away 100 which equals eight pounds which is 800 pence Okay, so for advanced mean questions, and I mean the average mean, not just difficult questions, it pays to know that actually the mean is a type of triangle, just like speed, distance, time, and density, and all those ones. So we work out the mean by doing the sum, that just means add the numbers together, over the amount of numbers. Now the reason it's helpful to know this as a triangle is sometimes in the advanced questions they will give you the mean and the amount or the mean and the sum and they'll ask you for something else. They might ask you for the amount or the sum. So with that in mind we can work out the total or the sum of the boys. So the mean of the boys is 11 and the uh, amount of the boys is 15. So we just using the triangle, we just times them together and we can work out what the sum is, or total is. So 10 times 15 is 150, add another 15, 165. Then we can work out the total of children. Same process. The mean of the children is 17. And the amount of children was 15 boys, 20, uh, sorry, 10 girls, so that's 25. And I can just do a grid. If you've got a calculator, then obviously you can use a calculator. So that's 200, 14 with a 0, 50, 
and 35. So let's add those together, 200, 140, 50, 35. Uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 4. So 425. So the total of the children is 425, the total of the boys is 165. So therefore, the total of the girls is the total total. Take away the boys' total. So 425 take away 165 so that's going to be 0 I'm going to have to borrow one off that so that's 6, 2 so that's 260 so all the girls added together is 260 but it's asked for the mean number of coins for the girls so mean of girls and we just use the standard sum over amount so we know that they add up to 260 and we know that there are 10 girls in total so that's going to be 26 okay so whenever you see this type of question it's about similarity the two triangles the small one and the big one are mathematically similar so you can work out a scale factor it might help sometimes just to draw out the small one. Not connecting very well, but anyway. Uh, let's draw out the small one. And let's draw out the big one. Okay. Ooh. And then let's label the sides. So that's four centimeters. That's 12. Now this little one at the bottom is X. Now this one here is actually X plus 4. And a lot of students will treat that as 4 and get the wrong answer. That's X plus 4 because it's 4 here and there's an X there. So it's X plus 4. So first thing to do with similarity questions is work out what the scale factor is. The scale factor to get from 4 to 12 we times by 3. So the scale factor is 3. So we know that we are going to times that by 3 and it will equal x plus 4. So if I do that now, so 3x, 3 times the x equals x plus 4. And it just becomes a simple solving question where we just need to solve what x is. So we're going to take away x from both sides and it becomes uh, 2x equals 4 and x equals 2. Let's just check that. If x is 2 there, then that makes that 6 and the original one 2. And 2 times 3 does indeed equal 6. So it says find the length of x and the length of x is 2. Okay so to start off this question the most important thing we realize is it's a circle inside a square. So we know one of these measurements already so we know that's going to be 40. Okay most of these shaded areas we're going to take we're going to find the area the big thing find the area of the small thing and normally take them away so let's first of all work out the area of the square okay which is going to be 40 times 40 so 4 times 4 is 16 and then the two zeros okay so next we're going to do the area of the circle and area of the circle is pi r squared now r is the radius and we're given the diameter we're given the full way across the circle so it's going to be pi times 20 squared because that's half of the diameter 
Okay, 20 squared is 2 times 2, which is 4, and then add the two zeros, which could be 400 pi. So what we want to do is we want to work out the area of the total missing bits. So area of total space, I'll call it. And I've shaded it in so the examiner can kind of understand what I mean by total space. And that's just going to be the area of the square take away the area of the circle. OK, so now we need the shaded area. And to do this, we simply divide the area of the total space by 4. Because the yellow bits here we don't want, and each of these four corners are the same area, we just divide it by 4. So it's going to be this, which we worked out before, all of that divided by 4. So 1,600 divided by 4 is 400. And 400 pi divided by 4 is just 100 pi. When working with box plots, we uh, first of all need to understand what the five points of a box plot are. We always have the lowest value on the left, then the lower quartile, then the median, then the upper quartile, and then the highest value on the right. And those five points will always be plotted on a box plot. You might be asked to plot them yourself, or they might be given to us. So to find the median, it's just the middle one. So let's have a look. It's halfway between 8 and 10, so that's going to be 9. The interquartile range is the distance between the lower quartile, which is the second one, LQ for lower quartile, and the upper quartile, which is the uh, fourth one. So you just need to take them away. So it's upper quartile, so interquartile range. It's upper quartile, take away lower quartile upper quartile is halfway between 16 and 18, so 17, and the lower quartile is 8. So we're doing 17 take away 8, which is 9. So they're both 9. Okay, whenever you're asked to compare two distributions, you're always going to be comparing the medians and the interquartile ranges, or just the ranges. Now since we've already worked out the interquartile range for the first one, I'm going to compare the interquartile ranges. So I'm going to first of all compare the medians. So let's have a look. So on my one uh, here, so what is this? This is the dogs. It's 9. And the cats is 16. So we write a statement such as, on average... And what are we saying? The cats scored higher or made more errors. On average, the cats made more errors. And always just write down the medians um, of the cats and the dogs as well. I'm not going to, but write down the fact that the cats did, uh, has a median of 16 and the dogs had a median of 9. Okay, That makes it really clear. Okay, The second one is comparing the um, interquartile ranges. So I'm just going to show the examiner that I'm doing the interquartile range of the cats. So it's going to be 20 take away 13, which is 7. So let's compare them. The cats had 7 and the dogs had 9. So I would say something like the spread of the errors was larger for dogs.
And again, write down the fact that the dogs had an interquartile range of 9 and the cats only had an interquartile range of 7. And that just shows how spread out our data is. So the cats were more consistent with their data, the dogs were a bit more spread out. OK, so a circle theorem question. With these questions, it's really important that you set all your work now and you give reasons for every step. So I'm going to do it one way and there probably are slightly different ways of doing it. And if you, as long as you give the reason, then that's absolutely fine. We're asked to find ODF and just to help us, I'm just going to mark that on. So it's that angle there. Now, uh, just finding this angle here, which we're going to start off with, it doesn't mean it's the same angle as that. You can't, you can't guarantee that the um, arrow is going to be symmetrical. So we're going to start off with this one. But how do I show the examiner that's the one I'm starting off with? Well, the letters are there so you can actually write down what you're trying to find. So I'm looking for angle OBC. And you can write the word angle or angle OBC or you can just do a little um, angle on top of the B. And we know that that's going to be 90 take away 51. And the reason is that angle between tangent and radius is 90 degrees and that's one of the circle theorems so uh, a a c is a tangent and o b because o is the center is a radius so the whole thing's going to be 90 so when i do that so i'm going to do 90 take away 51 which is 39 degrees. So we know that that's 39 degrees. And it's absolutely okay to mark it on the diagram as well. And actually sometimes, not often, but sometimes the examiner will look at the diagram and might give you some extra marks because you didn't show the working out. But most of the marks for these types of questions are for the reasons. And you can't really show reasons on the diagram in a way that the examiner is going to be able to see it. So... I also know, let's have a look what else I can work out, well, that's also 90 degrees and that's also 90 degrees. And uh, ADOB is a quadrilateral. So we can work out which angle we're going to pick next. Well, let's pick this angle here next. So what's that? DOB. So angle DOB is going to equal 360 take away 30 plus 90 plus 90 okay so I need to give a reason well, let's work it out first and we can give a reason afterwards so we're going to take away uh, what is it 880 plus 30 so that's uh, 210 from 360 that's going to be 150 degrees and the reason is angles in quadrilateral. And we should really say that the uh, angle ABO and ADO are angles between a tangent and radius as well. But I'm not going to. We've already used that, that reason and it's clear in our diagram that we've just repeated the same reason. Okay, so angle DOB we've got as 150. So let's mark that on our diagram. So we can work out this angle here. Okay. And it's very difficult to know what to call this angle because we've already called DOB once. So we could call this other DOB. Let's go for that. Other DOB equals 360 minus 150 okay and the reason for that is just angles on a, a point so that's 210 degrees angles on a point okay so what are we up to next well we can work out this angle here uh, and actually let's mark on the 210 as well We've got it all on our diagram. We can mark. Uh, we can work out angle DFB. So DFB is 
B and this time we're using the circle theorem that says angle at the centre which is the 150 is twice the angle at the circumference so angle at the centre is twice the angle at the circumference so it could be 150 divided by 2 which is 75 degrees so angle at centre twice angle at circumference. Now if your um, teacher has given you different ways of writing the circle frames down that's absolutely fine. There is no strict way of writing it down. So that's going to be 75 degrees. And if you look we've got the arrowhead BFDO uh, which is a quadrilateral and we've got three of the lengths. So we can work out ODF. I'm going to have to scroll up because my memory is not that good. So we're going to take them all away from 360. And what is it? Uh, 210, 75, and 39. Okay, so we're just going to take those away from uh, 360. Obviously, if you if you're doing this in the calculator paper, then please feel free to use a calculator. We get 36 degrees, and again, it's just angles in quadrilateral. As a rule of thumb, my experience with these questions is they're normally looking for between two and three reasons. Obviously, on this question, there's an awful lot of reasons. But if you walk out of the exam and you just think, oh, hang on, I only wrote down three and actually there's a fourth, sometimes you'll get the full marks. Um, so don't panic too much. Just when you're doing the question, try and write down as many reasons as you can. Even really obvious ones like angles on a straight line or angles in a quadrilateral will help you get the marks. Normally, again, for circle theorem ones, they're looking for... Um, circle theorems as well as those ones. Okay, so we're given an equation here, y equals x squared minus 2x, and we've given a partially filled out table. So the first thing we're going to do is just complete the table. So if x is 0, um, then x squared 0 squared is 0 minus 2 times 0 is just 0. So that's a nice easy one to start. Let's work our way down. So um, 3 squared is 9, take away 2 times 3, which is 6. So 9 take away 6 is 3. And 4 squared is 16, take away 2 times 8. 2 times 8 is 8. So that's going to be 8. Okay, minus 1 squared is 1. Minus 2 times minus 1 is plus 2. So that is going to be 3. Now you might notice that there's a symmetry here. So if I have a look at these ones here and these ones here, they're the same. Now you'll find that with a quadratic graph. Don't rely on it 100%, but if you've got 8, 3, 0 and then 0, 3, 9, then just check the value that looks like it's different to the symmetrical one. Okay, next thing we're going to do is plot this on the graph. So minus 2, 8. It's going to go here, uh, minus 1, 3, uh, 0, 0, uh, 1, minus 1, 2, 0, 3, 3, 4, 8. If it's a quadratic, it should be nice and symmetrical, which mine is. If you've got one that looks out of place, then just double check that you've done the calculations right. Now I am awful at drawing these, but what you there are a few rules with drawing quadratic graphs. First of all, it doesn't want feathering, which is like this. It doesn't want that. It wants just one continuous curve like that. Okay, and I'm going to try my best here. Make sure you go through all the points. So I'm going to try my best here. And make sure at the bottom it's a nice smooth bottom on it. 
if you have two points at the bottom that are the same height make sure you dip between them okay there's there's the rules right I did stop halfway through but I think I've just about got away with it okay the last one the last question says um, to solve this little equation here which says x squared minus 2x equals x plus 1 now you might notice that the left hand side of this we've just plotted the right hand side of it well we haven't plot we haven't got that so what you need to do is just plot the left hand side equation so we want to plot y equals x plus 1 now y equals x plus 1 is a gradient of 1 and the y intercept is 1 so I'm going to plot the y intercept as 1 and for every 1 we go across it goes up 1 so I'm going to just do that and you could do this with a table of values that would be fine as well I'm going to go the other way so for every 1 to the left it goes down 1 like so let's join it up like that excellent and the solutions are where this graph and this graph hit okay now you can see that they hit at this point here which looks like it's uh, let's have a look it's x equals uh, minus 0.3 it looks like but they also hit just here so let's have a look at what that is that looks like it's x equals 3.3 .3. and there's our two solutions so we're asked to convert the recurring decimal into a fraction and it's quite a hard and quite a difficult one so we've got the um, 2.1 that we're going to have to deal with and we've got the 0 0.047 recurring that we've got to deal with and I'll probably deal with them separately so this one is quite easy if 2 uh, if sorry if 0 0.1 is 1 tenth then this would be 21 tenths Okay, that would make 2.1. So that's the easy bit. Now, the way I do this, this uh, recurring one, is I just think, okay, so what's 0 0.47 recurring as a fraction? So if I call that x, then to bring the uh, numbers in front, I'm just going to delete that arrow, because I normally do this on top. Um, I think, right, what's 100x? Well, that's 47.47 recurring. And let's take them away. So it's 99x is going to be 47 take away 0 is just 47. And the two recurring bits will just take away. They will just cancel each other out. Divide both sides by 99. And so x is going to be 47 over 99. Now that's 0 0.47 recurring. We've got 0 0.047 recurring. So what the difference between this bit here and this bit here is all we need to do is just divide that by 10. And with fractions, when you divide by 10, you just times the bottom by 10. So what you want to do is just do so let's just show the examiner what I'm doing. It's just going to be 47 over 990. Okay, so we've got our fraction here. And we've got our fraction here. And we need to add those together. So we need to do 21 over 10 plus 47 over 990. So we need the bottoms the same. So I need to times top and bottom of this first fraction um, by 99 to get the bottoms the same. 
So um, the bottom one is going to be 990, which is the whole point of it. And so we need to do 21 times 99. Well, what I can do is times 21 by 100. And let's do this down here to make this. And then just take away 21 from it. So that's going to be... Uh, so 10 take away 1 is 9. 9 take away 2 is 7. That's going to be 0 and that's going to be 2. So it's 2079 over 990. We're going to add the 47 over 990. And with the bottoms the same, we just add the tops. So we're going to do 2079 plus 47. 6, 1, uh, that's going to be 7, 8, 12. So that's going to be 2126 over 990. Now it says in its simplest form. Now they're both even numbers. So I know I can divide top and bottom by 2. So let's have a go at doing that. So I can do it with bus stop method. Why not? 2 into 2 go 1. 2 into 1 don't go. 2 into 12 is 6. 2 and 6 are 3. So it's 1063. And then half of um, 900 is 450. Half of 90 is 45. But again, I can just do the bus stop method. 9990. Right. 2 into 9 go uh, 4. Carry the 1. Uh, 2 into 18 uh, go 9. Carry the 1. And 2 into 10 go uh, 5. So it's 495. Now, I don't think I can cancel that anymore. Um, you could probably spend hours and hours trying to cancel that. I assume um, that I can't cancel it anymore. Uh, I think with math sometimes you just look at it and go, mm, not quite sure I can do any more with that. The top one, it doesn't end in a 0 or a 5 and it's not even, so chances are um, I can't cancel it anymore. And there we go. Okay, for this question it's really easy to miss um, uh, understand the question by not f understanding what that squared does. Now as soon as you walk into the paper and you see a bracket squared, just write out the bracket and then write out the bracket again. So many times I see students times in the tens together and times in the root thirteens together. So, loads of different methods of working um, at this out. It's very similar to when you do quadratics, although it's with thirds. Um, you can do the first outside, inside, last, the smiley face, double smiles, rainbows, whatever method you choose. I'm going to be doing foil. But I don't mind which which method you want to do. And so we're doing first, so 10 times 10, which is 100. Outside, which is 10 times root 13, which we write as 10 root 13. And that doesn't look like a 3 at all. Ooh, okay, so uh, inside, which is root 13 times 10, which again we write as 10 root 13. And last, which is root 13 times root 13. Now, any time you times a third by itself, it just becomes the number. So it's technically root 169, which is 13. Okay, so all of these are pluses, because there's no minus in it. So to put these together, we've got 100 plus 10 root 13 plus 10 root 13 plus 13. So the 100 and the 13 go together, so 113 plus we've got 20 uh, we've got 10 lots of root 13 plus 10 lots of root 13, which is 20 lots of root 13. So it asks for what A and B are. So A is 113 and B is 20. Okay, the first thing to realize with this question is, 
to work out frequency density there is a triangle isn't there always a triangle for everything and the triangle is a frequency at the top frequency density and um, class width at the bottom now this is a bit of a weird triangle because actually it's not quite right um, because the frequency density is proportional to the frequency divided by class width so sometimes the frequency density will be twice as big as you'd expect so you do frequency divided by class width and it will be half as much uh, or you can divide it by 3 or divide it by 4 or 5 or whatever number you want so that's not quite accurate but for our purposes as long as we remember frequency density might be a different number but it will be proportional so if one of them you have to times by 2 you have to times them all by 2 so um, I'm going to do the class width column first and the class width is just the width of the group so 0 to 10 the class width is just 10 um, 10 for the next one then 20 to 25 is going to be 5 and I'm writing small here and 25 to 35 is 10 and then the last one is 15 so that's the class width sorted and the frequency density then is just the frequency divided by class width so we're just going round and just dividing them all okay so 7 divided by 10 is just 0 0.7 and then 10 divided by 10 is just 1. 6 divided by 5 is going to be, what, 1.2? If I can draw it. Uh, see, I'm writing too small here. Let's try it again. So 1.2. Uh, 9 divided by 10 is going to be 0 0.9. And 6 divided by 15. Oh, that's going to be quite a tricky one. So let's do um, the bus stop method for this. Uh, can I do the bus stop method? Or um, hmm. So I could do it as a fraction. 6 divided by 15. And I notice that I can divide Tom on by 3. So that's 2 over 5. So it's just 2 fifths, which is going to be 0.4. There we go. There's always There's always a way. Right, um, so we've got our frequency densities. Um, now we've got to figure out what scale to do on the left hand side for our frequency densities. Well, our highest number is this 1.2 here. So we need it to at least go up to 1.2. So if I go up in 0.2s, 0.2, 0.4, 0.6, 0.8, 1, 1.2, that would be perfect. So I'm going to go up in 0.2s. 0.4. 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, ah, uh, almost, <laughs> 1.0, I'm just going to put 1.0 because it's a bit easier and it looks nicer, and 0, 0.0, okay, so we're going to start drawing the histogram, now to do the histogram we just need to um, make sure that we have the correct ranges so first one 0 to 10 and it's similar to like a bar chart and um, so we're going to go up to 0 0.7 for the first one so it's going to go up here so it's going to go across to 10 and then down it's not perfect but we can cope uh, next one is 10 to 20 so we could go up to 1 okay uh, next one is 20 to 25 so we've got to be careful here so this says it's 1.2 so we're going to go up to 1.2 cross and we've got to be careful we go to the right place because it's only 20 to 25 and what's the next one? 25 to 35. So 25 to 35, and it's going to be 0 0.9. And the last one, 35 to 50, is 0 0.4. There we go, and that's our histogram. 
you probably will need to draw it a little bit more precisely than I've managed on this. Okay, so let's have a look at the next question. The next question says um, that uh, work out an estimate for the number of trees greater than 40. So if I draw a line up from f up at 40, and we're looking for these guys. Now, the total frequency of that bar is 6. And I've drawn a line that cut off, if I do it, if I shade it in, I've cut off a third of it. So it's gone a third of the way. So we're looking for two thirds of that six. Well, two thirds of six is just going to be four. So the answer to question B is four because there's six in total and we're looking for two thirds of it. Okay, so this question relies on your knowledge of sine and cos waves. The first one is just a basic sine wave and you should know that um, sine and cos um, work in sort of uh, um, units of 90. So point A uh, is 90 on the x-axis and point B is 180 on the x-axis. Now at point A um, all sine and cos waves go up to 1 so sine goes up to 1 and point B is at 0. That's a nice easy one. Now this second one is much much harder. If you imagine there's a different graph of f of x equals just cos x, what's happened with this equation here? Well, we have um, x times by b inside the function, and then we've times the function by a, and then we've added c on the end. So what do each of those bits do? Well, that affects um, the um, x um, uh, coordinates. Basically, that squishes it in if it's a positive number. Sorry, if, if it's a, uh, a number higher than 1. And it stretches it out if it's a decimal. So, let's have a look at what we've got. We've got a normal sine um, curve would start here and end at this point here. Okay, but we've got not just one of them, we've got three of them between 0 and 360. So we've got 1, 2, 3. That means that B is squishing in 3. So B equals 3. Okay, the number on the outside shows us how far it's stretched in the y direction. Now, this works as the if it's a number greater than 1, it stretches it out. If it's a decimal, it compresses it in. So what's happened? Well, we'd normally expect it to be between 1 and minus 1. And so it's it's got a, a period range of 2. Or on the y-axis, it's got a range of 2. Here, it's between 3 and minus 1. So it's doubled its height so therefore a is going to be 2 and the c at the end here tells us how far it's shifted on the y-axis if it's outside the function it goes on the y-axis well as I said before it would normally be at 1 and it's now moved up to 3 so it's moved up 2 so therefore c equals 2 To simplify a fraction, you need to divide top and bottom by something. So if I just try and divide top and bottom by something now, I need to find something that all six terms have in common. Well, there is nothing that all those terms have in common. So the way of starting this is to factorize the top and bottom, so put them into brackets, and then something will turn up. So let's um, factorize the top. So I know it's going to be x at the start. I need two numbers that add together to make 12 times together to make 35. Well, that's going to be 7 and 5. Then I need to factorise the bottom. Now, a little bit of a cheat here. I know one of them will be the same. So either one of them is going to be x plus 7 or one of them is going to be x plus 5. 
So I need two numbers to add together to make the 10x times together to make 21. Well, I know that 5 doesn't go into 21, but I know 7 does. So x plus 7 and x plus, well, to make the 21 and the 10, it needs to be 3. And all you need to do is divide top and bottom by... Oh, let's do it top and bottom. Get rid of that. Ugh. So all I need to do is divide top and bottom by x plus five, uh, x plus seven, even. And what that does is just gets rid of that and gets rid of that. The number, the fraction stayed the same, but now it's x plus five over x plus three. Okay, so this doesn't seem like the easiest questions because there's three shapes going on there's um, no numbers in it at all and we're asked to find a formula so the first place I'd start is working out well first of all what are the formulas we'll need well let's have a look so we've got a hemisphere And some of these formulas you will be given. So a hemisphere is um, a volume of a sphere and then halved. So instead of 4 over 3, I can just say 2 over 3, which is half of 4 over 3, pi r cubed. The uh, cone that we've got is going to be 1 third pi r squared h. And then the cylinder we have is the um, area of the circle times the height. Okay, now we need to find out what the bits are. So for the hemisphere, we just need R. Well, that's quite simple because R is just going to be X. It's the radius of the hemisphere. Okay, now what's more difficult is to work out the height of the cone. Well, if the radius across to the right is x, the radius of the circle up is also going to be x. So we know the height of the um, cone is going to be 4x because one of those x's is used on the hemisphere. We know the radius of the cone is going to be x because it's stated at the top. So let's keep going. The radius of the cylinder is going to be 10x and the height is just labeled as H. So that's nice and simple. Okay, now let's have a look at what this question's saying. It's saying that this thing here is going to be melted down and is going to be used to create this. So that's just saying that the volumes are going to be the same. So if I add the volume of the hemisphere to the volume of the cone, it should equal the volume of the cylinder. Okay, so we know that hemisphere plus the cone volume, and I should write volume here, show the examiner that I'm working with volumes, equals the volume of, I don't know why I wrote an S, my goodness, C for cylinder, wow, tell my maths teacher, right, cylinder, there we go. So hemisphere is um, two thirds pi, and we said that x was the radius, so x cubed, brilliant. So plus the cone, now what did we say the height of the cone was? We said the height of the cone was four x. So it's gonna be one third pi x squared, because the radius is x, and is it 4x? Let's double check that. Always double check. Yeah, it is. Okay. So the cylinder, and I'm going to leave that up so I can see it, is pi, and what's the r? So pi times 10x squared, and all of that squared, because all of that is r, times the height, so times h. Okay, so this is the formula we've got to work with. I'll put my lines down. 
Okay, so what have we got? Let's let's sort out the timeses first, and let's tidy this up. So that hasn't got any timeses in it. This we're timesing it by four, so it's going to be four thirds pi, and I'm timesing it by x, so it's going to be x cubed. This one I'm doing the ten x squared, so I need to square the ten and the x, so it's going to be a hundred. And let's do the pi next, pi, and it's going to be x squared h. Okay. Now, if you notice on the left-hand side, these two here are the same. They're both pi x cubed. So we can just add them together. So it's going to be 2 thirds plus 4 thirds. So that's going to be 6 thirds or just 2. So it's going to be 2 pi x cubed equals 100 pi x squared h. Brilliant. Okay. Now let's just check to see what it wants. It wants a formula of h in terms of x. So it wants h equals. Okay. So first thing I need to do, well, let's have a look. What's easy to do? Well, what's easy to do is just divide both sides by pi. Let's get rid of the pi's. So 2x cubed equals 100x squared h. Now we want h on its own, so we're getting close. We need to divide by the x squared first to get x, to get h on its own. So I'm going to divide by x squared, so we get 2x equals 100h. So we can already see we're really close. So to get h on its own, we need to divide both sides by 100. And that's going to be 2x over 100 equals h, or h equals, and we can cancel the 2 and the 100. We can divide them both um, by 2, equals x over 50. So our answer is h equals x over 50. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you found it useful and enjoyable. Um, don't forget to go onto the onmaths.com website for this paper and a whole load of other stuff. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please click like. If you want to see more from us, especially paper three, which we're looking at hopefully getting out um, as quickly as we can after Thursday, um, then subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much.